Hello, everyone. My name is Teresa Holmesy, and you're listening to the special Earth Week podcast series where we talk sustainability. I'm joined here today by Mimi Gonzalez Perias to discuss social sustainability. I guess let's just start with some introductions. Um, you know, who are you? What do you do? I'm Mimi Gonzalez Barrias, and um, this is my business card, and it says that I am the diversity communications specialist in the Office for Institutional Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at Central Michigan University. Fortunately, being born with the name Gonzalez Barrias, a lot of syllables are not foreign to me. So I can say the name of the office and the entire name of the university. Um, I'm returning to this university after decades of not being here. Uh, when I graduated way back in the early 80s with a Bachelor of Appli Applied Arts in Journalism, minor in communications, I just went out into the world. I've lived on both coasts. I've seen how things are done around this country, driven around and around the country uh, as a stand-up comedian and performed around the world as a stand-up comedian for the U.S. military. So I've seen a lot of things. And, well, what a surprise I would come back here to mid-Michigan. Central Michigan University, out in the middle of the corn, as a lot of people say. <laughs> uh, but uh, as you keep your eyes open and engage in self-care, uh, because I believe each of us is responsible for our own bodies and, uh, and our own health, especially uh, self-care is health care. And, you know, when you think about eating naturally, uh, what did, I think it was Hippocrates, the Hippocratic Oath who said that all, all illness origins in the belly, originates in the belly. Uh, that means that what you put in your system comes out through your system. So, you know, you think you're surrounded uh, oh, just by corn. Well, a lot of things have happened in this environment. Uh, I graduated from high school out here decades ago, and it's a very different uh, farming agricultural practices have changed so much as they have gotten uh, more focused on mass production. So I keep my eyes open. And so you're, the topic about sustainability is tied to health and uh, the health of the, the atmosphere, the environment, the planet that we live on. It all plays into this multidimensional thing that, um, I like looking at all the facets off. <laughs> it might be a yeah. little hard having a, yeah, I might have to ask you to bring me back to the point sometimes because I can be, I don't That's like to okay. think of it as ADD. I like to uh, reframe it as um, butterfly brain. Now, when you think, you know, butterflies fly, but when you think of flying, you just think of a bird going forward or a plane going forward, but a butterfly flies like this. <laughs> so, I just call it butterfly brain and I get to see a lot of things. Okay, well, I'm gonna take that butterfly and I'm bring it to uh, my first question. So um, okay. you've already kind of touched on a lot of things there, um, but I guess starting off simple, what does sustainability mean to you? Tomorrow, it means a tomorrow. Um, how's that for just a one word answer? Sustainability means um, there was a concept in the new age world that borrowed from Native American. And I hate to say that because that is not specific. That's like saying, you know, any of the people from South Africa or Mozambique or the Congo or uh, Ghana are, are Africans. Well, technically, yeah, but <laughs> there's specific people with specific tribes. So I, I cannot credit this saying, uh, but it shows up in a lot of indigenous cultures to think seven generations forward. And how are you living this life? Are you thinking seven generations forward? Um, I don't have children, but I certainly have friends with children. And um, I have nephews and nieces and sustainability means what kind of life is waiting for them. Uh, it's a little bit <clears throat> at odds with the uh, system of production 
and capital uh, that we live in. And um, well, that system of capital and production and uh, dividends and dollars and greed are simply not sustainable. And the planet is not going to, um, well, the planet, the planet is quite resilient. Our, our species is uh, at odds with its own survival. So sustainability and survival uh, are related closely, but I'd like to see us doing more than just surviving. We have a great opportunity to thrive. And that's, I think sustainability um, brings thriving into the conversation of how best to live on this planet. What was your, um, I guess, path into sustainability? Um, how have you gotten involved in it? And what sort of brought you um, to where you are right now? I'm originally from the Metro Detroit area. And uh, to grow up in Detroit in the 70s and 80s, 60s, 50s, uh, is to grow up with the great flex of industrial power. And industrial power really has a price and the price is paid on the environment. Uh, the Detroit River, the River Rouge, there used to be a joke, uh, you know, to not fall into the River Rouge that a man fell in and he died just from being exposed to that incredibly polluted water. I grew up during a time when pollution was finally being addressed. I remember flying into Detroit in the mid 70s uh, as an adolescent and flying into pink and green clouds, growing up with clouds of smoke and debris and particulates in the air. Um, that was just where you lived. Uh, I used to do a joke that, uh, Growing up, I believed that clouds actually came from smokestacks. <laughs> Mommy, drive by the cloud factory. They're making the pink ones today. Um, so I've lived through a time where environmentalism um, has really awoken in uh, mass consciousness the need for the ability to breathe and drink water. We need these two things. We need clean air and we need clean water. And for a long time in our human history, dumping, this is dumping, dump. Uh, we've made a dump out of the planet. And there are forces recognizing that, uh, slowly trying to correct it and Sometimes you want to just throw your hands up and say, I can't do anything. I, how am I going to fight all those smokestacks and steel mills and pollution? And everybody wants a car. And now this part of the world, everyone has a car. And now they have so much smog, they can't see the mountains. You, I can't do anything about that. I can do something about this. And there is one place where I can make a difference. And I start in that place. And I have to tell you that a Seneca elder, I went to see Twyla Nish, uh, God, my late 20s. And I was complaining about the state of the world and the pollution and what a mess it is. And she said to me, you know, before you start complaining about uh, polluters and huge corporations and the mess they're making of the planet, you better clean up your own piece of the planet. And that's your body. You smoke. So you are polluting your piece of earth. You have to start with yourself. So that was my late 20s. And uh, that has made a big difference. And I, you know, it took me three tries to get to where I am today, which is I finally stopped uh, nine years ago. Um, <laughs> we have to start with ourselves. This is a piece of the earth and we have a piece of earth. How do we treat this piece? 
and then, you know, what do you put in the body and then the grounds that you find your body on. Try to make less, less drives. You know, I don't have an electric car yet. So I do what I can. I really make the most effort with what I can because it's been seated in my thinking for a long time. A lot of what you said there um, definitely sticks out to me as far as thinking of the factories as um, cloud, cloud factories. Um, you know, I grew up in a very different environment than what you were describing for sure. Um, I'm from the Houston area, but obviously Houston is 600 square miles. So I am from the more affluent suburbs of Houston. And, um, you know, that definitely has kind of shaped my perspective on um, what sustainability is. But I remember distinctly as a kid, every time we would go um, to Galveston, you know, the, the, the Gulf of Mexico, we would have to drive through Pasadena, Texas. And um, Pasadena is basically um, the powerhouse of, of Houston. Um, so Houston is obviously a huge city um, and it's definitely an oil oil town, um, but Pasadena is, um, from what I remember, just a field of oil refineries and petrochemical facilities. And we used to drive through there and I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was so gorgeous because um, there's all these like twinkling lights and it's just this huge concrete masses and all these weird shaped um, you know, metal structures that are all twisting and bending. And um, they, there were so many lights, you know, they're all orange and they're twinkling. And um, sometimes there would be like, uh, you know, they'd burn off. Um, sometimes like there would be like flames, open flames coming off of the towers. And I thought that was so cool. And I remember at one time, like I was in the car with my family and I said, um, I said, wow, like, I would love to work there. Um, like I would love to just be able to spend my time there and just like, like this is so crazy and beautiful. Like I'd like to see this every single day. And my whole, my family would like, they thought it was hilarious. And I remember like as a child, I would, I got like a little indignant. I was like, what are you, they're laughing at me. You know, when, when, you know, when you're a kid and all the adults are laughing at you, doesn't, doesn't feel good. Does it? Cause you know, you said something that they found funny, but you meant it completely earnestly. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember kind of like, hmm, like, you know, and I'll show them sort of kind of conclusion, but um, it's funny because that that very thing that I, I found beautiful um, is something that I, I'm kind of against right now on that massive industrial complex. However, I was privileged enough to be able to drive through Pasadena and then not have to think about it ever again. And, you know, as I've gotten older, I do think about this um, as a significant memory, but also I've come to think of Pasadena in not just like this awful, horrible place, but a place where people live and a place where people work. And um, I've looked into Pasadena and what sort of movements they have. And um, it's actually a, a huge hotspot for, um, environmental justice. And there's a lot of neighboring communities in the Houston area that do um, <laughs> suffer from environmental racism. They're disproportionately mm -hmm. affected to environmental hazards. Um, you know, they, they have higher rates of cancer, um, higher exposure to respiratory illnesses, and it's like a serious problem. And although I was pretty removed from it, um, my perspective of Pasadena as the smokestacks being beautiful has definitely shifted, but now I find value in thinking of the people who want to stand up for that piece of their earth, you know? Um, and that's something that, you know, we're talking about social sustainability here, which we'll get more into what that means, but um, mm. something that when we talk about the environment and about, um, you know, environmental issues, they're very removed from people. Um, oftentimes, you know, you mentioned recycling, you mentioned, you know, even driving an electric car, like things like that, you know, those are the, the easy, you know, planting trees. That's our perception. We think of 
we think of environment, we think of national parks and forests and these stunning landscapes that need to be preserved, um, right? But, you know, as I've come further along in my education and my understanding of sustainability has deepened, I've come to realize that it, it means a lot more than that. And so, um, you know, our environment isn't just when we're talking about the environment, it's not just the ocean or some wild landscape or some the Amazon rainforest somewhere far away. It's our own neighborhoods, um, our mm. cities. Um, those are as much of the planet as, um, you know, some far away coral reef somewhere. Um, and so I think that that's very important to understand and recognize that we all have a stake in the environment and that it is ours, um, collectively ours. And it's not removed from people. And sometimes I think when we talk about nature, we kind of distance ourselves from it. Nature, natural, human, culture, they're different spheres, but they're not. Um, and so as far as what social sustainability is, um, it's recognizing that people are part of the equation and that helping the environment isn't exclusive from helping people. Um, and that you mentioned that yourself, that sustainability is health. Um, it is people's ability to live in an equitable and just world where they're not exposed to environmental hazards, um, where they can, you know, really plant their feet in the ground, even if that ground is concrete and, um, you know, bloom, I guess. I'm, I'm picking up some of your, your, your messages here, Mimi. When I'm talking to you, I start to get all of these metaphors of trees and, you know, blossoming. But um, I guess I wanted to mention that because um, you, you brought up environmentalism. And that's something that has historically been very um, exclusive and very elitist. Um, mm. It's something that I think only more recently has it started to have this awareness, you know, environmentalism, the early American pioneer environmentalism was this obsession with nature, you know, the transcendentalist, and they wanted to live, they wanted, they started their national parks, but they started those national parks by kicking natives off of it and saying, no, this is, this is not nature because people can't live here, you know, um, and so, like, it's, there's, there's a lot there in what environmentalism is so when we're talking about social sustainability we're trying to we're trying to move past that um and so we're trying to bring all of those intersections together um and so that is my take on um social sustainability but um i invited you here to kind of be the spokesperson the representative for social sustainability so in your own words, I guess, um, this is definitely a conversation, by the way, um, could you kind of explain to our listeners what um, social sustainability is and what that means to you from, you know, all of your perspectives and everything that you've experienced? You know, you just brought up something in what you were saying that really triggered this idea for me that mental health is part of the equation to build sustainable communities. And we are operating still in this country from a very uh, still profit-driven, punitive model. Um, I understood that uh, the UP just built three new prisons in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, the fact that we are warehousing humans, we are jailing, caging, and processing human bodies for fun and profit, um, which is uh, a really sick, unsustainable human model. Uh, and that's happening because these are private corporations, not things run by the county or the community like there used to be hospitals, <laughs> there used to be schools that you're property tax dollars paid for. Um, things have gotten so utterly privatized from this hypnosis of the free market and everything will correct itself. Well, the free market ain't free. You know, someone pays the price. Who's paying the price? You just brought up environmental racism. 
Who's paying the price? Bodies are paying the price. And very often uh, it's racialized, especially in this country, to put uh, people who are poor and to keep people who are poor and to keep uh, the stigma of being a person of color and uh, it's, it's very confusing to have this idea that uh, anybody can pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Well, it's really great when you have fantastic boots that you were born into. You know, if you're still trying to pull yourself up by your bootstraps because you're still trying to find boots that you can afford or boots that are at a goodwill that might fit, uh, it's a completely different story than people who were born to, here's a leather factory. What color boot do you want to wear today? You know, we have that uh, disparaging of a spectrum in this country. So, you know, let's keep hypnotizing people with this story. They pull yourself up by your bootstraps, make a million dollars. <laughs> and it drives people to madness. This mental health idea is also a part of, uh, I, I think what I'm really coming up to is the idea of a holistic approach to sustainability. And it doesn't just mean cement or the woods. It means a balance of what humans do on this planet. And I think we're getting to, I hope, I pray, or I am, um, not delightfully, but uh, pessimistically deluded that we're balancing, that we're trying to get to this state of balance where we recognize I can't have a million dollars if it means 8,500 other people have to have 10,000 a year to live on. I don't get a million. Um, I don't know if we're going to solve that. Now I feel like I've gone way off the topic, but uh, I, I do want to say that that's the thing about sustainable communities means how are we addressing human beings and our wholeness? And until we uh, put more energy and attention into a holistic point of view, uh, you can't even sustain your own well-being in this this uh, mix that we live in, the world that we live in. Can you ask me the question again? Because I feel like I've probably gone way off topic. You know, I think, I think, um, I think we're, we're getting somewhere. So to, to <laughs> kind of bring it, to ground it down for our listeners, because obviously when we're talking about sustainability, you know, I can go off. I can, I can do this as well, where I just start talking about a million things at a time, because to yeah. me, sustainability means everything um it, does. It, it encompasses a lot and so um i guess when when focusing on social sustainability we're focusing on um kind of our interactions um and our identities um this is where you know um dei diversity equity and inclusion um has a very strong role in building sustainable communities. Yes. Um, you can't build a sustainable community if you're only really concerned about recycling and, um, you know, windmills and that stuff. You also have to be kind of understanding that all of our social relations and making sure that people have access to the resources that they need. Equity is a huge, huge component of social sustainability. And the resources um, they need. What are the resources they need? They need to not live in a food desert. They need to live somewhere where they can get fresh food. Uh, I love the movement for ugly fruit coming, uh, ugly food coming to your house because it's still a tomato or potato or a pear and it just has a, a blemish on it. And there's still so much good food. But why don't people, uh, the fact, I'm not going to say why I don't. I'm pleased to see that we are taking steps toward making it a more sustainable, the throwing out as much food as we throw out and overproduce in this country is, 
um, not sustainable. So, you know, we are talking about the individual and your own capacity to be a holistic person. Um, and then the next level, family, and then the next level, family lives in community, and then the next level, community lives in region, and then the next level, region lives within continent, possibly, you know, regions within a continent. Um, I know where you have to start micro with yourself and then hopefully expand to macro. Um, but what's happening, you know, uh, Standing Rock is in the Dakotas, is in South Dakota, North Dakota. North Dakota is the Bakken Shale. No, South Dakota. Uh, oh, God. I just lost it. Standing Rock in South Dakota. I believe it's in South Dakota, or is it North Dakota? We can just say the Dakotas. We'll just say that for now. But the fact that it's the Dakotas, and those are a thousand miles from here, is still important to us in Michigan, because we're talking about water. And as the Lakota people say, Miniwachoni, water is life. We have to be talking about water. We have to be talking about, you know, does this whole conversation not begin and end with water? Hey, is that a BPA free bottle? It better be. <laughs> but what it is is reusable, so I'm not using a bunch of these SUPs, single use plastics. I didn't even think about that until two years ago when I was handing out. Uh, you know, disposable toothbrushes, you know, those little things that have a little bit of toothpaste in there and, you, and you throw it out. And then the uh, one of the people at the table is somebody who's hiked all the Pacific Coast Trail, the Appalachian Trail. And she's like, I don't want one. That's a single use plastic. Didn't even register for me what single use plastics are. So, I mean, still. We can play a part in sustainability. And we have to ask ourselves all the time, can I throw it out? Can I re recycle it? Can I recycle? Can I recycle? Strive for less garbage because you recycle and you have a compost. That's a, that's a place to start. <laughs> Are we way off on another? Did, did you ask a question or did I just interrupt you? <laughs> yeah, no, we're, this is the conversation. Um, you're good. Uh, so I guess um, I guess we're getting to it. But um, who you mentioned Standing Rock, which was in North Dakota, by the way, I checked. Thank you. Um, and so Thank you. who do we need to get involved in sustainability? Who needs to be involved in sustainability? Every single one of us needs to understand that sustainability begins with us. And then we need to engage our community. And our community can be the Chamber of Commerce, communicating with corporations that need to get on board. <laughs> uh, and some are, I mean, I'm a little suspicious. I did not like looking in the days of old when Newsweek was a was a glossy magazine and you could look through the pages of it. But I would see a lot of um, photographs, high resolution images of wheat fields, wheat in the summer, green wheat in the winter, yellow, vice versa, whatever. You know, and then at the bottom would say Exxon, we're doing our part to clean up the environment. You know, I mean, these corporations are fined, but those fines don't really change what happens. You know, those fines don't change all of the deaths of animals that suffer from oil spills. And it's not just the oil spills in the water and then on the land and then as, as part of the whole food, food chain. And it comes all the way to us. We're part of this food chain. So we need to engage corporations as citizens, corporate citizens, 
so they behave like responsible citizens. My neighbors cannot change the oil in their car and dump it on the ground. Now they used to. I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area. Someone created an action, you know, an environmental action where they made a stencil and they went and sprayed next to all of the drains that you see at curbs. This drains to the ocean. Don't put poison in here. Drains to the ocean, directly to the ocean. That's someone taking action. And it's actually, it did change some things. You know, we all have to be on the, on the ship that is actually turning. I want to believe it's turning, even though I hear, <laughs> you know, even though there are uh, decisions made on behalf of the Department of the Interior at the United States that benefit and profit private corporations who just want to amass capital. Um, uh, drilling in the national forests, cutting down the national forests. Uh, this all has to be, <laughs> you know, maybe it goes all the way back to what you said initially, you know, the start of environmentalism was to preserve these wild natural places at the cost of a genocide against the people who live there, against forced removal of people who live there. So, you know, maybe <laughs> I don't want to get, I could really go into a very cynical um exploration for reasons and I don't want to go there. I'm really trying to be conscientious about the words that come out of my mouth. Uh, you know, thought, word, deed. And I, I want understand. to understand it's it's very easy to to become cynical. So yeah. um I I feel that way a lot and I know that in the course of just this recording we've definitely gone over a lot of things here. And so um, kind of trying to focus in, um, I guess, from the, you know, 40 or so minutes that we've been talking. Um, Sorry, did we answer, did I answer anything directly? Yes, yes, you did. Don't, don't apologize. Don't apologize. You're being yourself. Okay. And that's why I invited you here, um, because I wanted to hear your perspectives. And I, I really appreciate you sharing it with me. You're going yeah, to have to edit. <laughs> that, is, that is for our podcast editor to do. Um, so if he wants to cut any of this out, he can. But if he doesn't, um, it all stays in. So um, wow. I suppose <laughs> if you were to just summarize everything that we've talked about so far in a very, in a simple, you know, pot, potentially single sentence, um, how would you do that? Sustainability begins with the individual and ends with the community. Start with yourself and remember everything you're doing for you, you're doing for each other. My addition to that as regarding social sustainability is just remembering that sustainability encompasses um, identities as well, um, diversity, what makes us different, um, and also what makes us similar in many ways, um, but also inclusion, you know, making sure that people are involved, um, that stakeholders are engaged, um, people aren't left out of the equation, that people have some sort of um, say in how decisions are made, um, which has, as we've said, not historically been the trend when, you know, in Pasadena, they started building those petrochemical facilities. And yes, the people who live there worked at those places, but they didn't have much of an option. And they're not able to leave very easily because their housing mm. isn't worth anything. And, mm. um, you know, they, they might not have the access to the resources that they need to have their health care met. And, you know, they might, they don't have as much autonomy or independence to just 
get up and leave. They might not have the means to do that. So taking that into account, that's a hypothetical example. Obviously, I'm not an expert on Pasadena. I just, since I brought it up previously, I thought I'd kind of loop back around. Um, what I'm trying to say using that example is a huge component is equity for sure. So um, given that right. we both given that we both brought up uh, cynicism, um, how what do we do to pr to prevent becoming cynical? Well, I'm going to come back to the word diversity. I need a diversity of opinion. I need a diversity of entertainment broadcasting programming that goes into my head. I don't need monoculture. I don't need the monoculture idea that everything is your net worth. I, that's not, that's just, that is not a sustainable way to live. I need a diversity in thinking. I need poetry, geography, physics, <laughs> you know, I need math. I need all of these things to have a well-rounded sense of existence. And I get that from my brother offers one thing, a different brother offers another thing, my mother offers something else. And together, uh, combined at the dinner table, we can have a great conversation as long as we don't get stuck in one conversation, one conversation about politics, meaning one conversation about the state of this country and where we are right now. Uh, I think that my most, well, the term is called conservative, but I don't believe that's accurate at all. Uh, but he would call himself conservative. I think the truth is uh, the brother who is prone to that language and some of the worst things that come from that language and thinking uh, are because I think he's very scared. Um, and doesn't know what else to think. So we have to give each other something else to think. Let's come back to poetry. The beat poets included um, Diane De Prima, who was with Mary Baraka uh, in their youth, and she was a beat poet. And she said in her poem, Rant, which was really a long-winded rant about not against, about the United States. In it, she said, and I'm bringing it up because I'm thinking about this brother who can only be afraid and therefore pose in all these uh, violent gun flailing poses. She said, the only war is the war against the imagination. All other wars are subsumed in it. My brother can't think his way out of this box of thinking that we're all stuck in. So he just continues to toe that line. And I have to bring a diverse idea to him that it isn't just might makes right. And I have to try and find my imagination through the war that's been waged against it. So, it takes a very beautiful, open mind to understand and embrace diversity and to see that in embracing diversity, diversity is embracing you. To be held by that idea is to be able to expand with it because that idea is an idea of expansion, not contraction. It's about opening and making room for. Again, I am off in my poetic cups, <laughs> uh, but I'll I'll pull back from that. No, no, no. the 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 poet The poetry is is always good. I mean, that's what they say. Poetry adds substance to life. Um, and I'm not much of a poet myself, um, and I don't really consume it that much. But I can appreciate a good one. I guess to wrap this up, um, given you know all the things that create frustration and the conflict and, you know, the, the hatred and the drama of our, our lives, our existence. Um, what keeps you going? 
you know, at the bottom of Pandora's box, after all those things were released. I know where this is going. <laughs> there's one tiny thing at the bottom of it. And it's hard because you have to go through, you know, pestilence, destruction, plagues, you know, infestations, all of these wild and crazy and, and terrifying things. Yet at the very bottom of it, there still remains hope. And when I can get through all the horrors, I do find there still is a light of hope that truly believes our fundamental nature as human beings is actual goodness, you know? Anne Frank even said that. She believes that people are actually good. And I'll tell you, I believe no matter who you voted for, if you have jumper cables in your car, you're the kind of person that will help. Mr. Rogers said, look for the helpers. Really, there's something inside each of us that will help if we can. I can't change the Bears Ears National Monument being uh, released for drilling. However, there's a new uh, president who has a new Secretary of the Interior, Deb Haaland, an indigenous woman from the Navajo Nation, uh, who first time a woman and first time someone indigenous, which is brilliant, which means that life is changing. I can't change that, but I can do what I can do. And anybody who has jumper cables in their car is coming from the fundamental goodness that's in each of us. I believe it. And they'll help. That means that you want to help if you can. You might not be able to, you know, fix a blown head gasket on the side of the road, but if you can offer a jump and you can help, you will. That, I think that that's who we really are. Well, that is very hopeful. Um, and I have to say that I love how you cite um, a bunch of different people <laughs> when speaking. Um, and so I guess um, now that we're reaching our, our conclusion, I want to thank you for all of your perspectives. And I, of course, want to thank our listeners who, if they made it this far and were able to follow along uh, with just <laughs> with everything that was said, um, thank you for making it this far into the episode. I hope that you maybe learned something or maybe just considered something new. Um, what would you say maybe that you, you hope someone could gain from this conversation? I hope your editor is able to cut this one hour conversation down to 20 minutes <laughs> and make it sound bites. Uh, <laughs> so I, I know, I, I know we're, we both have a lot of ideas and uh, what I hope people leave with is uh a reminder that, you know, we are connected to each other, no matter how separated we feel. And that is the work that we have to do, you know, that will sustain us. It'll sustain our good thinking. It'll sustain our good will. And it'll sustain the goodness that is there that we sometimes have to wade through to get to. That note, thank you. Thank you, Mimi. I appreciate this. And um, I hope everyone else does too. Uh, you've been an excellent guest. And um, I guess happy, happy Earth Week. Um, happy as this Earth is when Week. this will be coming out. Um, right? Every day is Earth Day, though, right? That's it. Every day is Earth Day. Every day is, every time you pick up a piece of trash, every day is Earth Day. Every time you don't throw something out of your car, Every day is Earth Day. Every time you recycle, compost, do what you can do. Stop polluting your own piece of earth, which is your body. Not easy, but it can be done. I think that's how we're going to, I'm going to start ending these episodes with, and just remember everyone, every day is Earth Day. Every day is Earth Day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Mimi. Um, Always a pleasure. And thank you for all the work you do. And you as well. And sustainability. Thank you, Teresa Hamzi. Mm -hmm.